functions on compact manifolds. Okay, okay so thank you very much for the presentation. Um, it's for me an honor to talk to this uh, traditional conference, especially because there are many connections between the School of uh, Professor Schulze, Professor C. Lee in Colombia. So today uh, I will talk about estimates for some of the functions uh, on compact manifolds. I will uh, present some spectral inequalities that uh, are valid for the uh, uh, eigen functions of elliptic positive pseudo differential operators on compact manifolds. So, uh, just to keep in mind, uh, let's fix one, uh, let's say, one compact manifold. And let's, see, uh, let's fix one elliptic operator. Okay? We can think first in the case of the, let's say, of the Laplace. And then, uh, of course, then, uh, in this case, we have a discrete system of the uh, values. And for this, we have a discrete Let's say you can choose a discrete system of eigen functions. Which are in correspondence with these eigen values. So uh, <coughs> the kind of spectral inequalities in which we are interested are uh, inequalities of this form. We take uh, let's say one eigen functions, any of these eigen functions, and then we want to compare the size, let's say, of these uh, eigen functions. Let's say the okay, infinity norm of this agent function with respect to, let's say, the ball, uh, one ball associated to the geodesic distance of the manifold of radius r. And uh, let's say, compare this infinity norm with uh, this other function, which is also the infinity norm of the walls of radius 2 r. So, when comparing this, which is, uh, this is a classical problem. In, in Geometric analysis, then we have to, uh, let's say, pay a price here. Um, here we have one uh, factor which is of exponential type, let's say something like this. Okay, let me put here some squares. And then, uh, one result, classical result uh, from the, let's say, 80s, says that this inequality is valid and this is known uh, like. Uh, the name of this inequality is the only property by the domain and pepper. Okay, this is a fundamental result. They published this uh, inequality in <coughs> inventions in 1986. And then uh, they use this uh, spectral inequality to measure, let's say, the nodal set of one agent function. This is, let's say, you take your your functions and then you want to measure in some sense the nodal uh, the set of uh, zeros. And then if you estimate, let's say, the, the, with respect to the volume form, the measure of this, of this set, of course it's zero. But then the appropriate form of measure, the, the size of this set, is using the household measure. So uh, it was known for some time that the Hausdorff measure of this, uh, let's say, set is bounded by a constant of this form. But then a classic conjecture by uh, Zhao uh, was uh, claiming that uh, the measure uh, of this nodal set also is estimated from below with the same constant. So Feferman and Donnelly. Uh, Proved this conjecture and this was a fundamental result. Uh, let's say geometric analysis from the from the end. Okay, so the goal uh, of this presentation uh, is give you to uh, put in perspective the validity of this kind of spectral inequality when you consider the case of a general elliptic operator. Okay? So so the question now is if this kind of spectral inequality is valid when you consider one uh, elliptic operator and you consider this operator, let's say, in one form and the class of one. So uh, the results that I will present are of uh, two kinds of forms. Uh, the first is on general manifolds. On general manifolds, we have the, the usual restrictions of the delta for the formander classes. <laughs> 
the one for the calculus, the one for math, which is this one. The delta and rover of which between C11. One, one. And the second one is that rho is larger than one minus rho. The second one is because you want that these classes uh, behave very well under change of coordinates. But then, <coughs> Let's say if you consider other kind of manifold, let's say the setting of the, if your manifold is a compact group, the idea is to prove this spectral inequalities also in the case of one elliptic operator, but then removing this condition here. So the idea is to prove that the spectral inequalities remain valid in the case where delta uh, satisfy just this inequality. Okay? So well, uh, the first was my model, and the second one on compatible groups was a uh, big work with Michael Ruchansky and Julio Delgado. So this is the motivation that I has uh, from, let's say, geometric analysis. But also, uh, there is some relation between these spectral inequalities uh, this kind of spectral inequality is being called with control theory. This is other, uh, other issue uh, because this kind of spectral inequality is fundamental. So, uh, to give a motivation, let me start with the most simplest case uh, of the heat equation. We know very well that if we consider uh, the interval, let's say 0 to 5, and we consider the heat equation there with the periodic conditions, then uh, our solution has a dissipative uh, behavior. Okay? The solution decays, let's say, um, okay, the solution decays uh, at infinity. So we start with your initial condition and then the solution of the equation depends on the, the properties of the propagator. And then we know that the uh, time uh, goes to infinity our solution in some sense decreases because of the properties of the propagator. So the question in control theory is uh, if you, let's say, if you can perturbate uh, your heat equation and it's some, let's say, input, which is the input there is, is the part that is in red in the second uh, uh, identity. And then the question is if for any time, if for any positive time, uh, the lens is one input, the lens is one function, let's say, uh, which is localized in some of the subset of the manifold, in such a way that when you add this input, uh, the solution of the resultant equation uh, satisfies that Ux_t is equal to zero for any point of the manifold. So this says that, okay, uh, in some sense you start with your initial condition and then you force, you, you can drive the solution from one initial confi configuration to, to the new state. Something like that. Excuse me? Could you use a different colored shaft, like white? I don't know if anybody else finds this kind of hard to see. Because this we can see really great. Okay. But I find the pink kind of <laughs> difficult. I mean, Okay, so when you drive from the board, you should switch to the iPhone. <coughs> so let me uh, this point. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the point is the following. Uh, this motivation from control theory. The point is that you can perturbate the heat equation and in some term here, uh, let's say in red. And the question is the following. The question is for any time that you fix, uh, you can find the existence of some input which is, uh, which is localized, which has support, let's say, in some open source of omega, of, of your manifold, omega of your manifold, uh, in such a way that the solution of the new uh, heat equation satisfies that UST is equal to zero for any point of the manifold. So, uh, this is a problem of control theory, of course, uh, maybe a difficult problem. The solution involves uh, micro-local analysis, Carle Van makes uh, this kind of things. But somehow it's related also with the validity of this spectral inequality. So, 
And in the case of the, let's say in the case of the torus, one can use the periodic Fourier analysis to show the existence of this kind of input. But on general, on general variables, you have to uh, do a more delicate, uh, let's say, analysis. So, to, let's say, to illustrate how the inputs uh, work. <laughs> <laughs> So now to illustrate how this kind of uh, inputs work, here you can see in the upper part we, we have one blue uh, part, one blue bottom, something like that. Uh, more or less this illustrates the size of the set omega and the function is supported there. So you start with one initial configuration, which is the one with the colors there. And what you do is to, uh, let's say, perturbate your equation, you add this input. And this is what happens. Let's say you do fits a time and you add this input, this is what happens with the solution. You start at the, the input and then you go to the final con configuration that you want, which is MLS. Okay. So the example on the left is the example of a system which is controllable like the heat equation, but you can involve, let's say, other kind of uh, models which are not controllable, like this one on the right hand side. Let me show you what happened. you have inputs in a system that is not controlled. So you get destroyed the, the system. So well. So well. <clears throat> now about uh, how to prove the, the validity of this spectral inequality. This is our problem. And why this is related with the problem of uncontrollability. This is something that uh, comes uh, the intuition of doing this kind of things comes from numerical experiments. Okay? So we know that if we are, the, let's say, in a Hilbert space, then we can approximate any element, uh, let's say, of your Hilbert space using a basis. And for this to have a good approximation, you just require a, let's say, final number of, uh, let's say, elements of your basis. This is what happened in a manifold. Okay? You have your manifold, you have one elliptic operator, you have your system of your functions, and if you want to approximate, let's say, one function and the function of your manifold, you just require, let's say, in a good way, a, a final system of agent functions. Plus some error. This error you can control because of the of the parseval of the parseval theorem. But okay, let me uh, maybe uh, give some intuition about this. How one can handle this kind of approximation. So here I will give you some uh, information. I will start with one function. This is uh, a function, okay, that belongs to one rectangular domain. Then we consider the Laplacian, let's say, and then we consider uh, the, the Laplacian with direct condition. And then <coughs> the idea is how much uh, agent functions of the Laplacian you have uh, to use in order to have a good approximation for this function. This numerically is something that one can do. And you see, I will give you some information. This is the initial function that you want to approximate. And then I will give you more information. Uh, in this corner, I will show you the function and the approximation of this function. Uh, on the right hand side, I will show you any agent function that I will add of this uh, Laplacian. Uh, here I will show you the current approximation of the, of the function. And later, uh, here I will illustrate the error of the approximation. Okay? So this is what happened. <clears throat> you start with the function. I don't know if you can see, yeah, but in the red is the formula of the initial, of the initial function that I showed. Okay? Which is, uh, that was that function. In blue, uh, you can see the product of these two cosines. This is the form that has, uh, that has uh, let's say, that has the uh, functions of the Dirichlet Laplacian in this case. And then uh, you can see that there uh, the functions are, have two indices, L and M. So to approximate, you just need, let's say, to make linear combination of these agent functions, and this is what happens. I will start just uh, with one agent function, which is a function uh, with index 01, yes, F01, 
And then this is the first eigenfunctions that I add because I just put one eigenfunction to this approximation. You can see here that the error is so big. And this is my approximation. Okay? This is what Now I add other uh, eigenfunctions. Now you can see that with just two uh, eigenfunctions, we have a better, let's say, uh, approximation of the eigenfunction. And you can see that the error here uh, now is uh, maybe more small. Now this is other eigenfunctions. Now you can see that the error becomes uh, more smaller. And you can see that the approximation is better. And you can continue adding more eigenfunctions. And this is what happened. Just with, uh, let's say, some fine agent functions uh, and this linear combination of fine agent functions, you have a reasonable approximation of the, of the, let's say, of the function that you want to approximate. So, if you can approximate, let's say, uh, functions on a linear study this way, uh, by finite, uh, let's say, a finite system of agent functions, the same happens uh, with the solution of the heat equation. Yes? I mean, you can start, you know, that uh, you can start, let's say, with the, the dissipative term here, you can see. You approximate this term by finding the terms of your functions, and then you apply the, the, the propagator. And this is what happens. Just using this fine agent function, you can approximate very well the solution. And you can see the evolution in the time. Then that you can uh, claim is that the solution goes to zero, that this is rational, because we know that we have these dissipative terms of the, let's say, of the, of the propagator. But then, now the question is, uh, if we can do the same uh, in the setting of control. I mean, if just uh, by approximating uh, by approximating the function with a finite system of agent function, you can also do the same uh, for the solution if you want this constraint that the solution at time t uh, goes to zero. Okay? So this is the problem. So you have to handle this, uh, let's say estimated agent functions in some open subset, and then in this setting is that this kind of spectral inequalities are important. Okay? So uh, this is more or, more or less uh, motivation that comes from numerical analysis. But um, then we go now to the mathematics. So our setting, of course, are compact manifolds um, of a special interest because uh, are the groups, because the, the groups are manifold with good symmetries. And in this kind of, a, of manifold, we have, uh, let's say, uh, some gain uh, from the point of view of the theory of the differential operator, the fifth one I mentioned, the uh, formatted classes need this constraint if you want to have a invariantly defined uh, classes. But in the setting of compact groups, you can remove this condition and you allow this complete range. And this is very nice because, for example, parametrices of some Laplacian uh, are in the second uh, class. So we work in this setting, uh, the groups, compact manifolds, manifolds with symmetries. This is very nice, in particular, the groups allow description of other homogeneous spaces. Let's say if you want the Ongari conjecture proven by Perelman, we know that uh, any three-dimensional simply connected, uh, connected and simply connected is the manifold, is different multi to the sphere. So this is a case where we start from a manifold and from formatted classes in that manifold. And you see this description of the groups because let's use if you want to the sphere, then you can gain uh, or remove this constraint of change of color because of the symmetries of the manifold. So uh, uh, these were the uh, maybe short explanations that I did before, the kind of spectral inequalities in which we are interested. So then we record in 1980, Donnelly and Preferman proved uh, this spectral inequality in one. Uh, this is one uh, people call double condition, and then uh, the walls there are uh, concentric walls. Okay? So something that one can ask is this uh, constant here is sharp and indeed because of this kind of consequences, one can deduce that indeed this constant is sharp. 
So uh, something that is interesting is that uh, this condition also uh, remains valid if you consider some of the functions. Let's say if you consider that a square the one biggest functions of a finite system of the functions, and you consider the linear combination, so the inequality to remains valid. And can preserve this exponential factor uh, in the validity of this total inequality. This was an observation by David Jenison and Tim Devo when estimating exactly the, the, this, uh, the, set, uh, the normal set for a sum of agent functions. Okay? So in that case, uh, let's say, for example, Gauss conjecture does work because uh, one can pass, uh, let's say, uh, this, is, this uh, inequality from from below, from above, but not this inequality from below. In general, one can show that in the case of some of the functions, the best that you can do is to put here zero. Because of the joy of the mindset. Anyway, so <coughs> there are many, many approaches to prove this, uh, this spectral inequality. Group. One is the uh, go for, uh, let's say, the Kahneman estimates. Another is to try to deduce this spectral inequality from other, maybe more simple, where one can do, uh, let's say, the geodosy of differential operator. So, um, I mentioned uh, in the case of some of the functions, the spectral inequality here in two is valid, but then uh, the question is if you can deduce this uh, inequality, let's say, from one inequality like the one in three. Check that this inequality in two is one inequality between an infinity norms, but the inequality in three is one inequality between L2 norms. So then if it's one, uh, let's say, uh, not empty open subset of your manifold, and then you go for the validity of the inequality in three. So if you prove the validity of this inequality, the one in three, then you can prove the validity of this inequality in two, just by, by an argument you see the solar behavior. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we know now that we can reduce the proof of these spectral inequalities to, to, to the proof of the spectral inequalities in, in three. Then the right way to, to approach this problem is to try to generalize according to the goal of, of, of this talk. Uh, the validity of these spectral inequalities in three in the case of general energy, positive differential operators on a one Okay. So, uh, <coughs> this is then uh, our problem, this is our motivating problem. If we can prove the validity of the spectral inequality in seeds, which compares yes, the L2 norm of one sum of agent function with respect to a complete manifold with the L2 norm of a, of a sum of agent function with respect to a one open source of the manifold. So, <coughs> What happened in terms of the, of the PDE associated to the elliptic operator that, uh, that you choose? Is that if you prove this kind of double property for the L2 norm, then you can prove the controllability of the corresponding diffusion one. And of course, this, is a lot of time. This, this was an open problem, for, let's say, a long time. <coughs> a very challenging problem. So, um, well, with this, uh, maybe. A clear question about the, the validity of the, of the let's say the inequality in, in six is uh, is okay. Then let's go for for maybe some definitions and these things. The first thing that we have to do is to is to choose a good class of pseudo differential operators. Then we go for the maybe more general class in the setting of manifold, which are the classes of Forman. Um, Maybe one can ask if this kind of spectral inequalities are also valid for elliptic operators in other calculus. Let's say like the, the calculus of the demo pair or other kind of calculus on manifolds with bonded. Then this is an open problem. Even in simplest cases, I will show you later. And then that we do is the, like I mentioned before to consider just the case of elliptic operators on closed manifolds and on compatible. So well, um, this is an overview definition of a zero differential operator. We have the definition of the Fourier transform. Um, later we have the definition of, a, of zero differential operator. 
there is two one, there is one symbol, but then to have a well-defined operator, we need to impose some regularity conditions on the symbol. Um, and then you can see there that uh, almost, uh, at least in the case of Rn, let's say in the case of Rn, um, the classes of zero differential operators which we denote by this are defined by the integral operators that satisfy the, the, the identity the, the, in terms of the Fourier transform and the inverse Fourier transform and where the symbol satisfy that uh, estimates about the growth of the derivative of the symbol with respect to the spatial derivative and the frequency variable and then you can see there are three parameters. One is m, which is the order, and the other two parameters that characterize the class, which is row and length. So well, you can do this very well uh, on a red. Uh, if you define these classes, then you can compose this operator, you can take and join, and these classes uh, became stable under, uh, let's say, uh, products and compositions. Products, compositions, and adjoints. Compositions and adjoints. And then you can do the same in the setting of the tolls, let's say, okay? In the case of derivatives, but, uh, in the frequency variable, you can take differences, the standard differences on the lattice. Then you have, uh, let's say, a specific Fourier transform of the toll, which are the uh, Fourier coefficients of the expansion of your uh, function in terms of exponential, and you got the definition, global definition of zero differential operators, okay? So there, you can define also, uh, let's say, classes of symbols, but then check that in this case, in the case of the term, you use uh, difference because your second variable is discrete, instead of a derivative because, uh, it, like in the case of RN. So these are, uh, let's say, two, two similar approaches, in some sense. Now, <coughs> The thing is that the torus is a manifold, so one can think about what happens if you localize zero differential operators from an end to the torus and give these two classes of the give these two classes the agree. I mean <coughs> when you define zero differential operators on the torus using localizations, agree with the, the classes on the torus using symbols satisfying this different condition. And then the thing is that these two classes agree. Okay? This is the point. So the uh, then you see different operators, uh, even with the uh, discrete uh, frequency variables. Uh, this is a good approach because you have then an alternative description of the calculus of Formander, at least in the torus. Then this was uh, this was uh, a work of Akranovich from the Navy, and then <coughs> other people did some other developments, uh, McLean, uh, Turunen, and Chanskan Turunen later. And then the question is, the question was, uh, if these classes of zero differential operators that you have on the torus, you can also extend this approach that you have on the torus, you see different operators, you can extend to the setting of the uh, compact limit. So, and then they construct a calculus uh, using also different operators. If you see uh, on a compact group, you have uh, one definition of Fourier transform, but for the definition of the Presentations. I will present this, this in detail as follows in the next uh, data. But then I think uh, you are familiar with the calculus of formatting in the setting of manifolds, so let me present this very quickly and then I will go for the calculus of Rochasan to Gunen in, in compact groups. So we know very well the formulation of zero differential operators on RM. If we want to define these classes, uh, in the setting of an uh, open subset of an end. Then we choose the open subset, we choose uh, our phase space, which is to an end. And then we take our parameters, the uh, m row and delta, and it's the order. And when we force one symbol to satisfy this inequality here, and when this happens, then we will say that our symbol belongs to the classes m row delta. Okay? So, to define zero differential operators on open subset, we don't need any restrictions on row and delta. Let's say if we want that, if we want to compose zero differential operators on open subsets, we just need the condition that the zero is less than or equal to delta, if delta is less than rho, and rho less than or equal to one. This is on. 
But if we extend this definition to the setting, let's say, of medicals, we have to uh, do something, we have to estimate remainders of asymptotic expansion and these kind of things, and from the estimates of these expansions, then we have to impose that condition, rho larger, rho larger than 1 minus delta. So this is the, the condition that arises in that set. Okay? So this is a constraint, this is a restriction, but uh, then this constraint, this restriction is true for many, many examples that are important, uh, let's say, in the setting of compatible groups, if you put, instead of your main, when you put a compatible group, and you put, let's say, one subplaxian satisfying one subplaxian associated to a formander system, then the parameters uh, of that operator is not in the formander class, in the standard formander class. That uh, I can mention this in more detail in the question session when it's in place. But, um, okay. So let me go for the calculus of pseudo differential operators on compatible groups. Maybe this is uh, the quite something about the presentation theory. Uh, we fix a compatible group and then we have to uh, define which uh, unitary representations are, or let me fix just the notation. So, we fix a unitary representation, which is a map from the group to the set of linear operators or some filter space. If we pose, let's say, continuity of this map, then the filter space is of finite dimension. And the definition of representation is that C operator star uh, is the inverse of the operator, and that, uh, let's say, CXY is CX by CY. This means that the uh, map uh, preserves the uh, operation of the group. And in some sense, you can you have a lot of information there. Uh, but for the Fourier analysis of a compact group, it's just important the set of irreducible representation. So one representation is irreducible if not if the representation is not the sum of other two unitary representations. So <coughs> with that um, definition in mind, uh, you have unitary representations that are equivalent in the sense that you can pass by change uh, basis from one representation to other, to another. And then if you define this equivalence relation, you can, uh, let's say, make the quotient between the set of unitary representation with this equivalent relation, and then you define the unitary work of a company. Okay? So, uh, something important here, you have a company group, then the unitary, the unitary one of the group is a discrete set. <coughs> and why this is important? Because this is uh, this uh, uh, set is the one that you use uh, to construct that Fourier inversion formula. So, in the same way that the Fourier transform is important to the pseudo differential operators uh, on R and the Fourier inversion formula also is important here in the setting of company groups, we have the same situation. So, you fix one unitary representation and then <coughs> you fix your hard measure and you define the Fourier plan. Okay? So now to that, uh, the Fourier transform of one function in one representation is now a matrix, okay? Because you can identify, let's say, your representation space with a, a finite dimension and complex space, and then this is a matrix. When you integrate, then you will have uh, something matrix bar. So you have then the definition of your Fourier coefficients. <coughs> I mentioned the Fourier transform now is a matrix. Uh, in each uh, representation space. But then something that is interesting here is the global uh, validity of the, uh, let's say, Fourier inversion formula. Okay? So you can recover the function from the Fourier transform using trace of matrices. This is uh, that happened here. So you take the representation, you multiply by the, uh, on the left of the right, by the Fourier transform of your function, you take the trace, decide the dimension of the representation space, and then we do sum over the, all the classes of uh, irreducible and unitary representations of your group. This is the use sum over all the, uh, let's say, uh, unitary dual, then you will get uh, the function. This is the function. So when uh, you have a good Fourier analysis there, if you have this good Fourier analysis, you can define zero differential. This is, this is, uh, something that is important. So, just let me go uh, a little bit in the definition of the classes on Rn. 
you, you can see in the definition of the classes of Rn, when you define the classes of symbols, you have this function which is bracket of size, the Japanese bracket, okay? This Japanese bracket is one function that in some sense is related with the, uh, let's say, a spectrum of the Laplace operator on Rn, something like that. And then, by following that philosophy, you can also define zero differential operators on compiling groups, because you have, let's say, two compiling groups, you take, uh, you, uh, let's say, the invariant metric, then for that you have the Laplacian, your Laplacian have this split spectrum, and uh, something that happens is that the entries of your representations are given functions of your Laplacian, which is, uh, which you can see, the identity here is left. So, he for each representation, for each representation, and the C square is the eigenvalue, the corresponding eigenvalue, which is, has the multiplicity the C square, this is the dimension of the representation space. You can define in a similar way, uh, like in Arem, this one, bracket side. This is our Japanese bracket in the setting of combining groups. And in this is related with the spectrum of the language. So, <coughs> Something that happened here is that to define zero differential operator, you have to quantize the operator. Okay? You have to quantize symbols. So the question is, um, which is a good definition of zero differential operator? So a good definition comes from the following part. If you have invested with a continuous linear uh, operator on a group, then uh, if you define this map sigma xi, Okay. When x belongs to the group and psi belongs to the uh, set of uh, irreducible and continuous representations, let's say psi belongs to the unique and dual, then <coughs> one can prove that your operator admits this, uh, let's say, global representation in terms of that function sigma, and then we go to this uh, map, the symbol of the okay. This is that happening here. So, <coughs> With respect to the total array, uh, you can see that the symbol in the first variable is defined in the group, but the second variable is discrete. The second variable inside is one element of your unitary dual, which is discrete. So the question is, if you want to define symbol classes in this, uh, in this setting, uh, how you can measure the regularity of your symbols? This is the point. How to, uh, let's say, derivate with respect to the first variable, you can respect all things. But how to derivate with respect to the second variable, which is discrete? So that one to here is to generalize the notion of difference operators on the lattice using the Fourier problem. So uh, maybe I don't want to go through the, the, the details of this definition of uh, difference operator. On the dual, uh, you can define, the, let's say, distribution by the image of the Fourier transform on distribution on the group. And then you can define difference operator there. So you can derivate, in some sense, this function, uh, let's say sigma a, which is uh, matrix value, with respect to the second uh, component using that difference operator. I can give the text about the definition of that difference operator. But this difference operator has order, yes, like the vector fields. And then in terms of that order, one can define the symbol classes. So <coughs> let's say uh, if you fix M and you fix rho and delta the plus rho and one, you define uh, the classes as in delta G by the class of symbols that satisfy the uh, estimates in J. Okay? So you take derivative with respect to the vector field for the spatial variable and you take differences, yes, like in the case of the lattice. And then uh, if you have the validity of that estimate, M is the order of the symbol <coughs> and one delta parameter that you have. So why do you, uh, why this point of view is, uh, is remarkable from the setting uh, of the theory of C differential operator? Is that with this construction, you can recover the definition of the Hormander classes uh, defined via the local coordinate system. And if you consider uh, delta and rows satisfying this inequality between C1 and 1, but only in bracket that 1 minus delta, then your operator belong, belongs to the uh, formatted class that you construct using localization. If and only if the symbol of the operator, because the operator is a continuous linear operator on, on, on G group, if the symbol of this operator 
satisfy the uh, inequalities here. So this is an alternative description for the number classes. But one can see that for the definition of these classes, you don't need this constraint here. So that uh, it's remarkable of the theory that when rho is less than one minus delta, you get new classes of zero differential operators, and you can include, for example, parametrices of, let's say, subplanetary, or not subplanetary. So when, uh, just give me two minutes to conclude. In the setting of uh, the construction of these new classes, then uh, give an open, give some open problems. One is uh, the characterization of the mapping properties of these operators, let's say, in LT spaces in terms of that one, with valid symbol. Another is how to, uh, let's say, give uh, spectral properties of one operator in terms of the properties of that one, with valid symbol. So this is something that uh, Rochancel to Lunen started in 2010, 2010, and uh, many people have been involved in this, uh, in this uh, kind of work. So, because we are talking about uh, the spectral inequalities, this was uh, our main motivation. We have now two uh, definition of electricity, the one in many groups, because you have invertibility of the symbol, let's say. You can define electricity uh, in the standard way, but then uh, electricity in the setting of company groups uh, is a little bit different because you have a matrix value symbol. Then to define electricity, you need that this matrix is invertible almost for the representations, and that uh, your math is satisfied this estimate. This somehow says that uh, the inverse of your math is so for the minus q. So with, that, with the second definition, you can, let's say, construct uh, parametrices of elliptic operators and these things. So the theory, the correlation to Lunen, is a statement like the theory of Hormander uh, by composition, subjoints, and construction of parametrices. This is something, <coughs> okay, about the preliminaries. Um, so now I go to the results. Uh, these were the results. About the validity of the spectral inequality, let's say, let's say uh, the inequality is 12. We have the validity uh, of the W condition for the L2 norm with respect to, with this exponential factor, you can see that, uh, for any elliptic positive zero differential operator of positive order, of this unit, okay? So lambda nu, lambda with the power not represents the uh, one in value, but then uh, the estimate is well uh, is given in terms of this exponential factor, which is the new root of your value, something like that. But then the condition that we have uh, for the validity of this spectral inequality is that your, is that your symbol your principal symbol of your operator is positive. This is a restriction, but this is a rational restriction because we want positivity of the operator, but we also want positivity of the principal symbol. Because there are many uh, classical results that say by the Pfeffer and Font and shows that you can have one positive operator and still that the principal symbol of the operator is negative, let's say an geodesic. So this is a rationable uh, condition. The first result is for manifolds. <coughs> and then uh, this is a, the first result. The first uh, inequality in 12 is for the L2 double condition. But then I mentioned you that you can deduce from this L2 uh, inequality the very infinite inequality using the sole the main So this is the result. Um, if you have the validity of this spectral inequality, then you have the control theory for the corresponding heat equation. This is the statement. Also, the conditions are the same. You have an elliptic operator of positive order, and then uh, the condition of the symbol is that the symbol is positive. Okay? And the concentric state minus the zero section is. So you have controllability of your heat equation. Um, but uh, I always emphasize about this restriction, low larger than my and the setting of many. This is something that we can remove in the setting of company groups. This was the motivation of presenting uh, both values, values of Armander and the values of Justin Lunen and company groups. So 
Well, we have the value of this W condition and also of the <coughs> L infinity estimate by Donnelly and Pfefferman. And then the controllability of the heat model associated to the Olympic operator. And then, uh, like some conclusions here, is that uh, in the proof of the spectral inequality in the setting of Pfefferman, the, of Donnelly and Pfefferman, they use Kahneman estimate. I mentioned it before. The thing is that uh, the Laplacian is a local operator, and the validity of the Kahneman estimates, in some sense, are related to the locality of the operator. But if you want to generalize this uh, to elliptic operators on, let's say, compact manifolds, with or without boundary, then you destroy completely, uh, let's say, this locality property. In general, pseudo differential operators are non local operators. So you don't have Kahneman estimate, which is the full by excellence if you want to prove this spectral inequality. This is something. And then, <coughs> it's strange because you have. Let's say you have one manifold with boundary, you have the validity of that spectral inequalities for the Laplacian, okay? And the Zeta or boundary conditions. For the case of, of the by Laplacian, the validity of that spectral inequalities was a recent work, in 2020, by the son of Andrew Young, result that appeared in the Journal of the Local Mathematical Society. But then, it's an open problem uh, to prove the similar result for these powers of the Laplacian. This is a more or less simple case. But if you choose the uh, sweet our boundary conditions, because if you give your initial boundary condition, then this is consequence of the spectral curve. Yes? You choose all the kind of boundary conditions. So when I will omit, let's say, the details about the proof, uh, just let me say that I did some topological construction and this kind of things, try to compactify the manifold. That I did was to take the manifold to multiply by the variable time, and then I did some topological construction in the setting of a compact groups that the resultant construction was to have a compact group where any transversal section was a copy of the group, uh, and of this looks like a long. Yes. So the thing was that uh, in that construction and the boundaries, one has to put one specific auto function and then one has to manage here a problem of the construction of the function, which was done by using numerical analysis. So well, um, from the mathematical point of view, this is one, this is all that I can say, just let me add that these controllability properties were so uh, are studied in other settings, they say uh, you can study this. Uh, for fluid mechanics, send the flux or a worry, uh, <coughs> other properties there, other models there. But this is what happens, let's say, when you start with the solution of a rather symmetric, uh, let, let's say, you start with the heat operator uh, and your initial condition, or the heat equation and your initial condition is uh, a solution which is rather symmetric, then Yeah. 